When did you realize the, you made the first Transformers? It made like a billion dollars, huge hit. When did you realize when you were before you were making it, during during making it, or was it after that you realized, oh, this is going to be a huge movie? Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So Spielberg calls me. I'll, I'll keep this short for the people over at Universal here. Okay, um, Spielberg called me up. Uh, I was sitting in my editor room in Santa Monica. He goes, Michael, I'd like you to do Transformers. It's about a boy who's getting his car, first car, and it turns into an alien. It turns into an it's it's an it's an alien Transformers. And I'm like, I literally swear to God, I, I did not grow up with Transformers. I I hung up the phone and I literally said. This is a bad idea. <laughs> so every studio in town turned the movie down. And I said to deference to Steven, I went to uh, Hasbro, met with the CEO, and I went to Transformer School. And I remember when Brian Goldner, CEO of Hasbro, and you, it's, it's very cool. You walk down Hasbro, you see literally the very first Monopoly board created on a, on, on a, on a, on a uh, uh, tablecloth, okay, the checkered uh, red and white tablecloth, and you see Mr. Potato Head and all these toys that I played with when I, when I was a kid, and I'm like, I sit in this big boardroom, they show you how they're unfolding this stuff, they start giving you the lore, um, which I really liked, but I remember zoning in on an anime, uh, an, an anime, Japanese anime uh, picture behind the CEO, and and movies, sometimes it's one image that can spark a movie. And I, uh, the script was not good at first. And I'm like, you probably, um, whatever, okay, let's just move. Um, I thought to myself, wow, if I make these robots really real, if they were, if you could believe that, they, because effects were not that advanced at that time, and I'll explain that. Um, and this image came to my, my head where what if a kid is trying to hide these robots that are, that are 20, 30 feet behind his house and his parents are inside? I said, to me, that was the movie. And that's a wish, wish fulfillment, fulfillment. And it was about, can we make this lifelike? And can we make, because these things will reflect 10,000 pieces of light. It's never been done in visual effects, and it kind of changed the game. We lost the Oscar, and that was bullshit, but whatever. OK. <laughs> All right? I agree. Um, but uh, uh, where am I in the story? You're talking about the, the you're in the, you've got, the, it was wish fulfillment. Oh, oh okay, okay. So, all right. So, so, so now we're Transformers. And Friday night, the guys would come to my, my, I have a bar. We have drinks and beers, bullshit, whatever. And I've got this, I like surrounding myself with normal people. And um, I'm not into the Hollywood scene. And um, they, they keep you grounded. And I make movies for audiences, and I'm not into all this, like, you know, whatever. Um, and I, this guy, Mike Fisher, who's, who was a former uh, pro quarterback from Texas, he's like, hey, Bay, uh, I, mean, I mean, I really like Ridley Scott movies. And I'm like, I do too, Mike. And he goes, uh, he goes you know, I, I don't know, Bay. I mean, this Transformer thing you're doing, I don't know. I'm like, yeah. And then you just start feeling terrible about yourself. I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, I know. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. And then I, I, I remember the first day of the shoot, we shot Tyrese running and Scorpinox diving out of the sand and diving right behind him. And that was the first effect they did, and ILM did it. And then I remember showing it to Mike Fisher, uh, my screening room, and he goes, oh, man, I, okay, I get it now. I get it now. So that, that's how that happened. Uh, my only other question about Transformers, you obviously made a, a bunch of Transformers movies, and would, do you think, because you, I don't, obviously you made the first one and you were never sure how many you were going to make, you weren't sure if you were going to do a sequel, would you have done actually anything differently with the storylines had you known you were going to make more of them? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because it was always a one-off, and you never knew you were going to do a whole thing. So literally, we did one, and... It was weird when we were doing the first one, and then Peter Jackson had seen the the trailer. He called Spielberg. He goes, "That movie's going to be huge," and I didn't know. Um, but but when you saw with the audience, it's like um, like the test screening. Here's a test screening. Okay, well, let me just give you experience as a director at a test screening where you we fill up an audience way bigger than this, 400 people, and we have two houses. We have. Families in one house, 400 people, and then the next house starts 15 minutes 
later, that's uh, more adults. And you sit there, I sit on the side, and I've got the sound knob, and the people in the front hate, because I turn it louder as it goes, and, um, um, and I'm watching this, and I'm like, and this movie's not complete, and I'm like, oh my god, oh, they, this is just a dumb, dumb kid movie, this is terrible. You know, oh, this is awful. Then I go to the next theater, watch that, and now we're in the adult thing, and then there's empty seat, and then there's this dude sitting next to me, and halfway through, and I'm like, oh, I want to throw up. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. All directors do, by the way. That's just that's just the way it goes. And I go to the guy, I said, do you like this movie? And he, he, he doesn't know who I am. He goes, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, I'm so depressed. So it was a crazy night. So the studio's all there, the studio's all nervous, and the, the score and the, 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 the family uh, theater was a 94, which is a massive score for an unfinished movie, and the same one for the adult was 94. So I'm like, okay, maybe there's something here, and there you go. It was a billion dollars. I mean, whatever. Um, <laughs> anyway. Jumping into why I actually am talking to you tonight. Ambulance. Right, ambulance. Hey, did you, hang on, wait, wait, let me ask you a question. Did you guys like it? Did, yeah, oh really? Okay. What? You love it. Come on, let's hear that. What'd you say? What'd you say? I didn't like it. I love it. So, uh, I'm, w with casting this, how was it in terms of, did you know, what is it like for you to cast a movie nowadays? Is it literally you texting people and saying... No, I was lucky. I mean, the, these, the, the, was, Aza was my sixth choice, Jake was my seventh, and Yaya was my first. No, I'm kidding. I'm, that's a total <laughs> joke. Total joke. And you better erase any of that if you shot it, okay? <laughs> that's a total sarcastic joke. Um, I've always wanted to work with Jake, and um, I, I told my agent, was, I was right... I'm, Writing a big movie with a, 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 a big writer, and I, I just wanted to get back. I love shooting. I'm very passionate. I don't even have a director chair on my set. I don't have Video Village. I don't have a trailer. I'm the type of director that splatters of blood, holds a camera. I'm right there uh, with actors, and you heard that word, that Bayham thing, right? And it's not my word. I did not create that. My crews created that because uh, I like to keep it fast, and this was a very fast movie. I, I called my agent. I know I'm rambling right now, but um, I, I said, I just want to do something fast and intense. And uh, he says, well, there was a script that's been sitting around on the, on the uh, Bradley, how long has it been sitting there? This is one of the producers, Bradley Fisher. How, how many? How many? Six or seven years. Six or seven years. Sitting. So, um, uh, and I read it, and I was developing a crime story because I, I I was developing another crime story that was sort of I wanted to have an uh, the audience feel like they're on a crime that goes south really fast and just keep it intense. And this had a lot of those markings, and reworked the script a bit, um, and um, uh, okay, where are we? On I was asking about how did you get the three of them? So 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 okay. The business was getting very very busy, which means people were getting booked everywhere. It was COVID was still going on, and people were figuring out a way to do it safe, and um, uh, and, and it's hard to get availabilities of actors. And and Jake, Jake, uh, I got the word that he was available. We called him. Brad Bradley helped us. Uh, I had a great call with Jake. Uh, the studio, it was written for two white brothers, and the studio called me, this guy Peter, and he goes, you should check into Yaya, uh, he's an African American guy, and I said, well, I don't know about that, I don't know, because um, I felt it might be forced, whatever, and then I, I, I said, is Yaya a real name? I've never seen his work. And then I saw his work, and I'm like, that guy's going to be a movie star, and I want to work with him. So then I, 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 I wrote in the kids, and I figured out, okay, this might be cooler to have it this way, because he gets adopted. They're trying to save the life of this guy. They both live in a rough neighborhood, but they're trying to save this kid, um, and he gets adopted into a bank robbing family. Uh, and I loved working with the actors, and Aza was uh, always... Uh, uh, my first choice right off the bat, but uh, it was it was a you never know what you get. And just the the vibe that we had between the actors was was great. Camaraderie. Something that no one in this audience is going to realize, and because I didn't believe it when uh, you told me, but this was made I believe in 39 days. 38. 
38 days. Now, for people that don't realize, maybe you can explain, um, how long was your shoot on, say, the first Transformers movie or any of the Transformers movies? Um, like, let's just say uh, Armageddon was 120 days because you're putting the spacesuits. Each, each spacesuit needed five people. It's the craziest crap in the world. Um, let me explain that. First day, Ben Affleck, way down, we wrecked, we we're shooting in the Badlands and uh, 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 Dakotas, and I got a microphone or whatever to, to, to the actors. I said, they're walking out of a plane crash, and wind machines, 100 mile an hour winds, and all of a sudden I see Ben Affleck like do, trying to hit his face mask, face shield. And they had real NASA like, uh, like locks on their uh, helmets. And I'm like, cut, 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 what's going on? Ben, Ben, what's going on? So we have to run literally like a football field toward him. And he was trying to fight a rock to bust his mask because he couldn't breathe because the air thing's shut. So that's why it was complicated. So that was a long shoot. Transformers are usually about 100 days to about 90 something days. Um, this, this one uh, was 38. Um, a normal movie shoots about 20 to 30 shots a day. Luckily, I'm a fast shooter. That's one of the things I'm good at is just a shot maker, very fast and like very efficient, um, leapfrogging my cameras. Um, uh, so we were shooting about 120 shots a day, and that's real. Uh, but, it w but it helped the movie and helped the performances because as an actor, if you're trying to keep that level of tension, it's very exhausting to... to to go to a trailer, come back, and it, it, to do that, you want to you want to shoot it fast so you keep that level of tension up for the performance. All right. How many cameras do you typically use how, for ambulance? How many cameras were typical uh, at all times? Well, we would have uh, Komodos, we, which is a smaller little uh, red. We would have drones. We we would have like ten cameras, but not on every shot. Sometimes sandbags. Sometimes just putting them around. Uh, me operating, my DP, uh, an operator, um, some bagged cameras. So yeah. there, There's a shot in the movie, and I, I could be wrong about this, but there's a police, a lot of police cars get destroyed in this movie, but there's one where it feels like it crashes into a camera. Um, is that, was that camera destroyed? Um, I don't think so, uh, no. I, I, we actually, Red said, we want to have you destroy a camera and put it on screen, and we kept trying to destroy them, and they wouldn't get destroyed. <laughs> But no, it was actually in a, in a housing. There is, um, in all, every movie you make, you do these crazy effing shots. But in this movie, you, there it goes to another level because of the, the way you use drones. So can you talk a little bit about how, had you been thinking about using drones before, and what was the inspiration for using extensive drone shots in this film? So I always try to, uh, come up with new stuff, and, and this movie, because it was a short shoot, not a lot of money, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story. S Spielberg, uh, who I'm friends with, I said, I said in um, War of the Worlds, I said when Tom Cruise, middle of the movie, toward the uh, second, third act, Tom Cruise runs to a hill, and you see these planes whoosh, whoosh, going past the camera, and he looks over a hill, and you don't see over the hill. Like Stephen, Stephen, why? Why didn't we get to see over the hill? That looked like cool shit that was we were to see. And he goes, ah, $5 million. So it's $5 million scene. I cut, I cut it, I cut it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I, that's the scene I wanted to see. <laughs> well, I cut it, you know? And what it made me think of is I've had all the money in the world. He's had all the money in the world. And it's great as a director to put, uh, you know, to tie your hand one hand behind your back and have limitations. That's a challenge. A movie needs to be a challenge for a director. And it's cool to just be, I can't tell you how much fun it, it was to, uh, first of all, my uh, cops around the world like my movies, so I get away with a lot of stuff, okay? Um, Miami is where I live most of the time. Miami cops, uh, you know, they'll let us get away with shit. I'm with Walt Berg and Dwayne Johnson and Anthony Mackie, and it's me with the camera and the sound guy, and we got a dead body, and we're in a van. And Mark's just like, we have no police escort. He just starts driving. We are laughing. Mark is driving. He, Mark's a great driver, Walt Berg. And he's driving through the city, 
and cops would look at him, and he goes, oh, hey, sweetheart, how are you, baby? <laughs> like, we keep driving, we're laughing, the, body, the dead bodies went rolling around, and that is fun. That's just great stuff. That's where you feel like you're in film school again, and it just gets back down to basics, and that's kind of what this movie was. Cut to, okay, I, I try to come up with cool shots on, on movies, even though I have less money, less, less toys, but I'm like, okay, drone work is sort of boring, okay? And I'm like, how can I like change this up? So I started looking at these 19-year-old kids, these drone racers, some of the best in the world. And um, I got them, we, we kind of tricked out some of their cameras, um, and they would do shit that is just amazing. And I'm like, I was tough on them. I'm, I was like the Sean Connery to them. I'm saying, yeah, dude, I want you to fly through that, that, that fucking explosion. You do? He's 19 years old. You do? Yeah. Don't fuck it up, because you get. <laughs> I, I I screw around with people, but I do it as like a tough love thing, and they actually do it. Um, I said, yeah, I want you. You saw one of the, the the he goes right under the cars and jumping over the thing. I said, yeah. He goes, do we get to practice? I said, no, dude. I'm doing this jump once, and we got him. <laughs> and um, but seriously, you know, always have a fire marshal uh, for safety on sets, and a lot of drone people. Might not be as good. He saw these kids work and just the skill level they had, and he would let them. Like, no one would ever let you fly two feet from City Hall with the with the literally the radar towers and the cell towers right there. I mean, these kids were just whoo, dive bombing, and um, you know, you just challenge them, and then they they said, "We've never ever had a director allow us to do any of this." So. It just kind of creates a new kind of language here. Also, you have helicopters in this movie that are very close to the ground. And um, I, I, is that normally allowed, or did, is that special permits? You don't need special permits for that. You need special permits to go under the bridge. I wrote that scene on a Sunday. I said, I need a kid. Where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> we, we're going to wait. Just go and come back. <laughs> very rude. Um, so, um, wait, I'll wait for, don't wait. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, I wrote that on a Sunday, I, I, and, and I worked with Fred North, who's one of the great helicopter pilots, French guy, um, and another pilot I work with, they're really amazing flyers. Uh, it's very dangerous work when you work with these people, that's why you need to work with the best. Um, we got approval to go under the bridge. Uh, we shot that scene you saw there in two and a half hours, all right? That's fast, and um, I, you know, I'll tell you, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I told Jake, I said, all right, Jake, um, there's a helo that's gonna come by, and it's gonna be about 20 feet from you. Don't worry, this is what they do, this is what they've been doing, you know? I, I've, I've flown with them for 25 years, and um, he goes, okay, okay. And he, he didn't see the helo, because the helo was way up there, and it dive bombs him. And it comes comes down, it comes right by him, I said, and he's shot, shot at it, and he gets in the thing, and they start getting chased. And uh, like I put Yaya, you know, we would have a stunt driver in there, that's a stuntman hanging out the side, but that's Jake actually at the door shooting at a real helo. Um, uh, but Yaya, I, I just learned this today from Yaya. It, it, this is what he said on Milwaukee, because I'm in the Porsche Cayenne, which has a crane arm. It's a very, oh, it's BMW this time, and it's a crane arm that goes, it's a very fast car, and the arm kind of can move around, and it's, it's controlled by four people in there, and I'm in there with the, 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 the operators, and I'm doing the zoom and whatnot, and uh, Yaya, and I've got a radio to Yaya, we're right outside his window, and he gets on the radio. He's driving about 55 miles an hour. Yaya's a very good driver, by the way. We would train him, stunt people before the movie. And he gets on the radio. He goes, Mike, this is the craziest shit in the world. You got two motherfucking ambulances, I mean, two motherfucking helos behind me. I said, Yaya, get off the fucking walkie talkie and focus. <laughs> so those are real helos right off the side of him. And what he told me today, he goes, because it was the craziest shit I've ever done, I put. Uh, a live stream to my buddy <laughs> in the ambulance, <laughs> and he put his phone on, all right? That was pretty funny <laughs> to hear that. But um, it just gives more authenticity to the movie, but you know, you, you, I'm extremely safe as a director, and I don't take it for granted at all. I mean, we did over a thousand stunts, not even a Band-Aid on this movie was, was used. So, um, uh, you know, I, 
like uh, I got I got crap. I did that Instagram uh, posting, okay, and they censored the thing. And it's 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 the explosion where the ambulance comes through the cars. That's all real. It's a ratchet. It's very very violent. Um, I've done more of those probably than anybody in the world. Uh, I work with the best crew. Um, if you look at the Instagram thing, my assistant shot it, and. I'm in the fire, black fire suit, and I'm standing up on the dolly because I might fuck up my camera because I, I, the ambulance might hit me. We've got two catch cars that the cars are made to be our blockers. I, I can dive back, and my, my dolly grip has a car there by a curb. Um, and we might screw up the dolly, but that stuff's replaceable. And what you're watching for, because it's microseconds, if you've done, you've done this a lot and you go through the physics, it's like as a director, not a lot of directors know how to set up their own stunts and know you always have to try to predict what could go wrong. And um, when these moments come up, when these scenes come up, I am so serious on the set. And my crew gets very, very serious. Uh, stunt people, you hire the best of the best. Each one has a different skill level, which, which they're great runners, great drivers. What, what you know, you hire the best of the best. And um, uh, but I'm on the dolly and I'm standing there. I'm not even looking through the camera because I want to be able to jump back and I've got a monitor where I'm watching. But what I'm watching, because the, the ambulance is being pulled by a wire, uh, it's going 50 something miles an hour and it goes to a cable and a truck is pulling it like that way. It's coming through. As soon as it comes through, those hits those cars, um, a, 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 an electronic cable cutter cuts it. So what you watch for we invented on Armageddon a car flipper, so we know it's only going to go 15 feet. And the thing you're watching for is that violent thing. It's a car, we wrap it with a cable, and it gets pulled, and it starts to spin violently, but it's getting pulled with such force, it's going that way. It's not going to come this way, it's going to go that way because of the force of the cable. The cable's super, super strong. So, um, and I'm, 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 I, we go through over and over with the stunt people where they are, because those are the ones I'm concerned about. Um, uh, one stunt person hung in there a microsecond too long. And so what I'm watching for is when that ambulance comes through and hits, you want to make sure it's not coming this way. If it turns this way, I'm in trouble, okay? So as my assistant shot it from over here. The over the shoulder are the most dangerous looking shots when you do action. Um, so it looks more dangerous. But I see that it's coming and I know that it's a couple feet, not past me, but it's not going to be, it can't make a right turn, all right? Um, so that I know that I am safe at that time, but I'm concerned about the stuntman that's coming to me and um, he's gonna get wedged because he's running right to the dolly. He was supposed to go past my dolly, but he was running right to it. Um, and the ambulance hits is at 10 miles an hour. I had plenty of time to jump off. The stunt person I knew was fine and I raised my arms and because um, I knew that was a perfectly planned stunt. I think the mayor gave me shit, the governor gave me shit, uh, Instagram like censored it, but that was a perfectly planned stunt, so. No, I, I wanted to let the audience ask like- Yeah, so, yeah, come on, so, let's go. Uh, real, real fast, guys, because I know there's some real big fans of yours in this okay. audience. Okay. I know this person right there is a huge fan. Okay. Rapid fire, it all has to be fast. I just want to say before any, anything, I'm like your biggest fan of all time. You inspired me to want to become a director. Transformers Age of Extinction is my favorite movie of all time. Transformers 1 is when I learned I wanted to become a director. Oh, Transformers Age of Extinction is my favorite movie of all time. Transformers 1 is when I knew I wanted to be a um, movie director. And I'm actually, um, because of your influence, I'm actually going to Art Center, College of Design. I know, yeah, because of you, yeah. Yeah, I actually just got off a, a movie shoot today to like come to this event, so. Yeah, so um, one question I had, I wrote it down because it's kind of a, uh, well, it's kind of important. Um, you know what you should go, you should go to your teacher? You should, yeah, yeah. Hang on. You should go to your teacher and say, yeah, I'm quitting school because Bay just gave me a job. <laughs> I'm actually going to ask you, um, how would you recommend like aspiring directors get into the industry in order to... Um, what? He said rapid fire, so I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I, I apologize. Please, just chill out. Um, <laughs> How would you recommend uh, aspiring directors get into the industry in order to like eventually make the kind of movies that you make? And also, are you hiring, by the way? <laughs> Very funny. Okay. Um, listen, there's no set. It's not like a doctor where you go 
pre-med, boom, 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 become a doctor. Uh, um, you know, you have to, you got to knock down doors, all right? It's not going to come to you. And it's like, I, you could shoot a movie on an iPhone still. You know, I mean, I do funny videos on iPhones, and the iPhone's got some great stuff to it. Um, you just have to shoot, and you have to, you got to figure out what you really love. Do you love editing? Do you love sound? Do you love um, uh, producing? I mean, it's just, uh, if you want to be a director, you, you, you have to learn how to deal with people. You have to learn time is money. You know, you've got to get your dreams on the screen, but you've got to um, inspire your crew, and... It's a, it's a, it's literally, directing is exhausting, and, you, and it's, it's literally, it's like a sporting event, but you, it doesn't stop. The train, once it goes, it doesn't stop, and, and you gotta, you gotta bring it in on budget, you know? So, um, but I would recommend just shooting short stories, um, and uh, that's what I would do. Um, were you influenced by the movie um, Wild Bunch by Sam Peckinpah because he uses lots of quick cuts. It's very bloody, very violent, like some of your films. It made me think you saw that movie and said, I'm going to outperform him. I have a new idea. I'm going to go around and he's going to stay on the stage. I, th I think so, that's... Okay, we could change. Yeah. Uh, yeah, gonna... uh, I actually did my, the my senior thesis, or one of them, on uh, the decline of the Western hero. And if you look at Westerns, if you study Westerns, uh, they reflect history. You see how um, the Mexican, what is it, the Mexican uh, war we had, and then we've got uh, Nazis coming in, and then you see the hero where you would only shoot him in the front, and the wild bunch is where you would shoot, the, you would shoot your enemy in the back. It's the, it was more the Vietnam era of war. Um, and it was a very inspirational uh, movie because it's, it, it's like the decline of the Western hero, you know? Uh, I was very bloody. Um, not that it, it, that's inspiring, but I'm just you can look at how history plays in westerns. It's very interesting. So I watched you film a commercial for six hours and then was politely asked to leave. It was very enjoyable. What, what, what commercial? It was Burger King and it was in Glendale. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you were trying to get a dog to do something. And it wasn't exactly coming off. I right. thought it looked great. Right. But um, who asked you to leave? Some lady. Ah, like oh, I hate that. I, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's great. That's great. So um, I, I love the way your stuff looks. And another guy who I just adore the way he shoots is Tony Scott. Oh, so I love Tony. I was friends with Tony. Tony was very nice to me. And I was very sad when he passed. But uh, yeah, go on. That's what I'm hoping for. Could, could you tell us a story about spending time with Tony Scott? I, you know I was in college and I, I saw Top Gun uh, with some fraternity brothers in Connecticut and I'm like, oh my God, well, see Raiders of the Lost Ark, I see this and, uh, and you hear the music, you see Tom Cruise on the thing and like it, it looked so cool and I'm like, this is what I want to do. Uh, you know, being taken under Jerry Bruckheimer, Don Simpson's wing, who did Top Gun and whatnot, work with Tony a lot. Tony was... Uh, very inspirational. The, the, the Scott brothers were very inspirational because they came from commercials. And um, uh, so uh, that's where I came from. But it's good that, to me, it was always about becoming a movie director. And it was just stepping stones. So like a director, what he's talking about, I had videos to do. You know, I was doing a video, like story videos we were doing like every week, every other week. And then it went on to commercials. Um, uh, just, but just meeting him and just learning from him. Uh, it was great, you know. Keep going. Oh, come on. I feel like this is like a. Um. Yeah. So I just think you're the goat as far as action filmmaking goes. Yeah, I think everybody in this room can agree that. Um, I was just wondering, um, out of all your movies, um, what 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 movie do you look at from yourself and say this is my masterpiece? Well, I don't look at movies like I don't like try to pat myself on the back. I mean, they're fun things that I've done. You look at movies as different wars each time, and you have a love for each thing on movies. Um, I mean, one of the fun ones that I did that, that that just like I see it and it makes me chuckle was Pain Again, you know. <laughs> um, and it was something. It was like we did it for twenty-two million bucks. We had so much fun doing it, and it's so wacky, and it's just. Uh, <laughs> 
I don't know. It was just, it, I think it's Dwayne Johnson's best performance. Okay. He quit the day, the week before. And I'm like, I wrote him this long letter. And I'm like, you are going to be my secret weapon. And um, uh, anyway, so there's love for each movie because it's all different feelings, you know? So thank you. Hey, Mike. Love the movie. Um, I always tell people when Michael Bay shoots an actor, he makes them a movie star. So I'm curious, was there an actor growing up that you wish you could go back and direct in a movie? Like somebody you looked up to, you're like, man, if I had that actor in my movie, I would have made him even a bigger movie star than he already was. You know, it's interesting. Um, Aza, um, I think it was day three. And remember, we're shooting at a fast clip. And we just, you're just getting to know actors as you go. And every actor is different, like psychology-wise. Like, like uh, Ed Harris. You know, I'm, I'm my second movie, and I'm down low, and uh, we're shooting in Alcatraz in the real place where Birdman of Alcatraz was housed, and it's kind of creepy. And Ed Harris is doing a scene, his first night, he had a lot of dialogue, and I'm down low here, and there's uh, the guy with the, uh, the, the effect smoke, and Ed's saying his stuff, and, he, and he's just like, are you doing smoke? Are you doing smoke? He's like yelling, I'm like, what the hell's going on? He's out of his mind. <laughs> and third take, would you stop doing smoke? I'm like, whoa. Okay. But it was his process. It was his process, and you learn that was his process. I love working with Ed Harris because now I know how he works. He gets really riled up, and his fifth take are the brilliant takes. Sean Connery was the third, the second to third take. Um, everyone, every actor is different. Uh, Aza, um, on this, uh, uh, we were doing a shot where she gives a finger to Jake. Uh, well, it's a great moment because she puts her hands up. She's like this, and I wanted to hear. I, I, I told the sound guys I wanted to hear that her brothers and sisters are looking for her. And you hear all the sirens around, and she's got a choice. She could run, and then she hears that heart thing, and that's so cool. She runs back. All right, and and, and you know it's like kind of a love letter to first responders here. And she was running to give the finger, okay, yeah. It's, um, she was running, she gave the finger, and then when you change lenses, when you go to a longer lens, you have to slow down a little because you've got this huge ass movie screen. And if she's moving too fast, and it's a tight shot, she's gonna whack her, where are you going? Dude, all right, you go, go, we'll, we'll hold. <laughs> so we, she could whack around, meaning like boom, boom, uh, and, and you know, strobe on the screen. Um, and I'm like, Aza, slow down, slow down. And she doesn't know me, I don't know her. She goes, you're picking on me, you're picking, what are you, what are you picking on? I'm like, Aza, well, come over here, let's talk. And she's like, we get in our first like, fight. And she's intense, she's, she's, she's intense, and she's fun to hang out with, but she's intense. And I'm like, listen to me. I mean, I'm just telling you, this camera sees different than your eye, and I know what I'm doing, I can make you great. And she goes, but you're picking on me. And I said to her, after she, I let her speak, I said, I'm going to make you better than you've ever been. Okay? And I'm very proud of her performance. She was a trooper beyond troopers. And she did a great job. And I think we've made a real discovery uh, in movies with her. Because she's a great hero in this movie. <laughs> uh, just I mean, quick question. Ambulance 2? I come on, know. come on. We got to keep going on. Okay, okay, like, you know, by the time I'm 35, I want to do another movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was just wondering, uh, I'm Jack. Uh, what random action movies... I'm Mike. Oh, hey. Okay, Jack. What, what random action movies are you into recently or anything you're obsessed with recently? I mean, I'm having a brain fart right now, seriously. Um, random action movies that I've seen... I don't know, can we talk about a TV show? Yellowstone, baby. Yellowstone. I, I really like Yellowstone. Yeah, I have to ask you a question. If actually they asked you to direct any of Yellowstone, would you do it? You know, like I said, I would not want to do Star Wars 5 because I, I as, as, like Ridley Scott said, the greatest, the toughest thing for a director to do is cre to create the world. And I like creating the world, but that might be fun. 
I mean, I just, the horses and the Stetson hats and just the beautiful landscape, uh, it's fun. It's a fun show. I would love to see yeah. you Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I was on a horse once with my parents. I was in Palm Springs, and I had to climb the stairs to get on the horse. This is a true story. And I'm a kid, and I get on. I don't even put my hands on the, uh, in the stirrups, maybe one foot or more one foot. I, I, I didn't even grab the reins, and the horse bolts, and he runs over a gully, okay? And I'm grabbing the horn and the hair on the horse, and I'm down low. Like that movie. What was the movie? Uh, uh, the, the one with the kid, the beach, the horse. Uh, Black oh, Black Stallion. Black Stallion. Okay. So we're running oh, over a gully. Group we run. We run. We are charging over a golf course. I'm passing guys with golf carts and the whole thing. And I'm looking behind, and I'm almost falling off this horse. And he's tearing down. And I see these three uh, cowboys. Yeah, yeah. Behind. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, childhood horror story. Okay. Uh, before you ask the question, I just want to point out before this, when I was meeting people outside and checking people in, I, it, it's very rare for me to hear so many people say, I can't wait to see Bay talk. I can't wait to be a part of this. And also, I'm being serious. Like it's not, oh, it's not usually like that. And no one has left. Like they go to the bathroom, but they come back. That also is not the norm. Most people, people they have shit to do. Right. I'm sorry for interrupting you. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I have a question. What drives you to make the movies the way that you do? Is it the adrenaline, the passion, the art, the audience? Okay. I'll tell you uh, personally. I love to shoot. I I, I, I just it, it's so much fun for me to be involved, and it's it, it's a it's a. I love working with crews. I love like everyone's input. It's a collaborative experience. Um, and uh, when I don't like something, you don't know it, but, uh, but it's fun. And it's, it's, it's an adrenaline rush. It's, uh, um, I, I love working with actors. Uh, it's so exhilarating when you start hearing music to your, your, your scenes. It's so interesting when actors add so much more. Um, it's fun. I mean, you, you don't know when you cut a movie, it could be shit. You'd have no idea. Um, um, this has been a fun one, watching with crowds, um, because what directors do with like a 350-person house when you test it, you watch body language, and you count how many people, like we have already had two or three go to the bathroom during my talk, okay, so that's bad, that's bad, <laughs> all right? Because I only had six on my 350 house when watching the movie, all right, and that was two hours, okay? Um, well, they did watch the movie and then okay, doing fine. the Q&A. Should have gone before, should have gone before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually work at the company Falk, so I just, which is Falk Ambulance, and uh, I did do a set visit one day while you were while you were. I directing. remember seeing you. Yes, yeah, so uh, movie turned out great. We uh, loved it, and uh, so I just want to say that up front. Um, but my question is, would you ever be interested in doing a horror film? Yeah, I, I mean, I you know, uh, The Shining, I mean, when you see those two little twin girls, oh my God, fuck. I, I mean... I saw that at the Village Theater when I was young, and like uh, it was an empty theater, 1,200 uh, seat. Uh, I saw it in the, like a matinee or whatever. I mean, it's terrifying. I, I, I do like horror movies. I mean, I saw, I saw The Exorcist, I think, when I was 12, and I slept w between my parents that night, okay? <laughs> okay, quick question. Um, on a previous Collider screening, Jerry Bruckheimer said that in one day you did 72 setups. Is that still the record for you? And what movie was that on? No, I, I, I am now up to 120. We've done 120. On this movie, we did 120 many days. That's crazy. That's yeah. insane. For, for people that don't realize, a normal shoot could be like... 20, no, 20, 25, 30. Um, yeah, but what, I, listen, I've been doing this a long time, and, and the thing is, there's too much, everything's too precious. And certain things definitely have to be precious, but the, this is a movie where the speed was, was it helped the adrenaline of the movie. And um, uh, so it was helpful on this movie to do it like that. It's not fun, it's, it's tough. I mean, you, you, but it's, it was, it, it's a cool study for me and just to make it. Let me tell you the hardest day for, on this, okay? 
we had that gigantic bank area. We had the streets all blocked down. I was, it was the LA Times building, the city hall right there, the, the LA uh, PD headquarters right there. And it's a major deal to get that. And they said, this is the only time, last time you were ever gonna get this corner, this area. And we had the scene where the little blue car pulls up, okay? And I'm like, this is a no joke. Uh, and this is where it separates the, the, the men from the boys, okay? And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, I go to my DP, we are so screwed right now. We have 19 minutes of light right now, and my dog, who is a big mastiff, who's, who's 227 pounds, I have to get his ass into that fucking car, okay? And I'm like, Nitro, get in there. He's like, what the fuck do you want me to get in? I don't fit, I go in an Escalade, all right? And so he got in there, his head sticks out, and I'm like, we grab a camera, and like, um, Garrett comes out, and he's like, it's his first day with me. I'm like, welcome to Bayham, ba welcome to Bayham, baby, because he goes, we got a rehearsal? I said, no. All right, and they were all basically all real cops, not actors, and except for Cedric, who was the actor who pushes uh, my seal seal guy Remy, um, and uh, we had to shoot the, all that in 19 minutes. Um, so, because uh, the sun was dropping, and so anyway. Yeah, by the way, that's Faye's dog. That's in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's definitely not trained. Uh, so. My question is, like, in all of your films, you create this sense of found family, found brotherhood amongst all the actors every time. How do you facilitate that on set? How do I what? Facilitate the sense of found brotherhood or found family in, like, all of your movies. Yeah, you might be right. I actually haven't thought like that. Um, go, ahead, go through the movies. I mean, Ar Armageddon. I mean, uh, Armageddon, even Transformers. Yeah. You know, uh, 13 hours, you're right. Hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, I used to always think my movie archetype that I liked the, the best was like the, the normal person becoming a hero, doing extraordinary things when they never thought they could. Um, it's like Nick Cage in The Rock. Uh, he comes to my house, and he's been working out a lot. And the first time meeting him, he goes, yeah, I've been working out a lot. And um, I... Uh, well, Nick, you're an FBI chemical weapons expert. Who's well, I want to have my shirt sleeves ripped off. I'm like, dude, you've never used a gun. I mean, it's kind of weird, don't you think? So it's always the, to me, I like the old wise man uh, you know, taking someone who's normal and turning him into a hero. I don't know, it's just, just something that's been interesting to me. This was an interesting movie because you're dealing with two people, one, one robbing a bank and doing it for a noble reason to save his wife, and then one who is just charming everybody. Um, and you like these guys, and it's a, it's a weird, interesting dynamic, and, and I, you know, what I've found from audiences is they're sympathizing with these guys. And if you look at my movies, they've always been this rah-rah pro-America, and I, I just did press tours in, in uh, Europe, in the four different countries, and they go, they go, you, you Bay, you've done movies that are so rah-rah America, but now I've seen through some of your movies from Pain and Gain, which shows the narcissism of the, like kind of Instagram and whatnot, and this, this you can you can be, get, become the American dream and do it in all evil ways, and then you got 13 hours where America's not going to come save your ass, and um, and that they've got to go in and you know uh, six people have to fight back, and um, uh, it turns into the whole group. Um, uh, and then you've got this one where you've got a military person coming back and he's sort of screwed over by our government. And um, it's sort of weirdly the decline of the American dream, you know? So it's, uh, um, I don't know. Um, just a quick question. Were, did you play one of the cops well, uh, outside of the, the bank? Say, say, say that what? Did you play one of the cops outside of the bank? No. No. Okay. You want to know where I am? I will tell you exactly where I am. Yeah. Okay. When when Jake holds those baby booties, remember low budget movie. When he holds the baby booties, those are my baby booties. Okay. <laughs> okay. And now and I'm going to give you the one nugget. This is the one nugget. When he sh when when Yaya holds that picture up and he's looking, he goes ah. Mrs. Burns was my third grade teacher, by the way. I just want you to know that. Okay. Um, he holds a picture. If you look at the movie again, you can actually see my mom holding me as a baby. Okay? 
and I never Greeked it out. <laughs> True story. Uh, Michael, thank you for your time, for being here. One of my questions is what you just said about, you know, a lot of your movies are about America and everything, and I was just wondering, how do you get like the government to like let you play with all the toys that they have? And I mean, that's the coolest thing. Like every time I watch your movies, I'm like, how did he get him to do that? Like let him get, like play with the helicopters and the carriers and everything. Can, I, can you can expand I, on that? Can I follow up to that? Because in this, in this movie, I believe the truck that is the command center of the LAPD was something that's like a prototype. I could be wrong, but I, I think it is a prototype, which goes to your point of how the F do you keep on getting this prototype equipment? Okay, um, uh, the, the, I, I forgot what we've talked about today because I've been talking for nine hours. Um, uh, I, I had, there are 52 real cops in this movie, so basically everyone is real. Real SWAT, real snipers, real undercover SIS. Uh, uh, most of those people in the shootout, they're all real police. Um, you know, not great actors, but they work, they feel real. No, seriously, no, seriously. But, but the tactics, a lot of the tactics are all from them. Um, I thought chases or you just put a spike strip down and whatever, but that's not how they do it. They really manipulate with uh, hostage takers. They put pressure on, off. So that, these are all real stuff. I mean, literally, it's so much fun when you have 52 real police on there. You could go like that. Fool, fuck yourself. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And that's a total joke. That's a total joke. No, seriously. Um, um, the, having, you know, the, you do get some special things where, like, uh, Hey, can we get a Hilo, uh, LAPD Hilo flyby, and two minutes later, Hilo comes by? I mean, that's fun. Um, but no, it's it, because I, I treat the military well. Um, I'm, it's, I've become friends with so many people in the military. I've worked with the Pentagon a lot. Um, and they know that I, I treat them well with respect, and I show how it really is. Um, and they are an amazing group of people that will put their lives on the line, even police, paramedics, all of them. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's fascinating that they give of themselves so much and they don't get enough appreciation. Um, and you know, it's true, all right? Um, but you know, like, like Yah, 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 his character, Will's character, he comes back and he can't get that surgery. I mean, listen, America kind of screws over some of our soldiers coming back and it's sad. Um, we, t we take them for granted sometimes, and uh, you know, sometimes the governments are planning wars that we don't need to be in, you know? So, um, I mean, what's going on right now in Ukraine is, uh, is it's, it's just, in our lifetime, is, is just, it's, it's devastating. How did you get that prototype of that uh, command center for this? Well, we made it, and they gave me a, a truck, and, um, uh, but, you know, I've been like, uh, uh, the first to use a bunch of the military weapon systems, uh, you know. I mean, when I asked when I was in my third movie, okay, I go, I go to NASA, I want the space shuttle, and they go, okay, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> wow. I'm the only director in the world to get it twice, on the, on the, you know. And then I'm like, well, I want the B-2 uh, stealth bomber uh, for Armageddon. Well, no, 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 you can't do that. That's, it's, it needs to be moved into the cover of night. We're shooting on a, a military base, Edwards Air Force Base, which is totally secure. Well, we need to move it in the cover of night. And I said, well, can I get it? Well, 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 uh, okay, okay, we can get it. Um, and so they had, on that day on the shoot, they had this line of death, and they had two military people uh, with, machine, with uh, M16s at that time. And Bruce and the actors are there, and... and uh, it, they have a sign that says, you cross this line, lethal force will be used. By lunchtime, I was sitting in that motherfucker, okay? Okay, all right? You just got to be good with the gift of gab here, okay? <laughs> hey, Michael. Is there, I've seen The Rock a hundred times. I love that movie. If I'm really busy, I'll st I catch it on TV. I'll still have to sit and watch. Uh, is there any truth? You, there was a time where you said you might have done a sequel, and is there any? Is that something that would possibly happen in the future, or is that not something you're interested in? I mean, I, I mean, listen, it was a it was a great learning experience uh, for me. Um, it was great working with those actors, uh, but 
I mean, they were asking me today, could have been, could, could, it, could Sean's characters have been uh, James Bond? And I'm like, yeah, that, that was always thought of slightly in the movie, um, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, not a sequel, I don't know. Do you have any plans on making another Transformer movie? I mean, listen, it, it was a great ride doing it. It really was fun. Um, uh, but I, it, it, I'm, I'm, I want to do other things. And uh, uh, I love making movies. Um, so I, I like kind of going from big to small. You know, this is a small one. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll do a big one next. I mean, if I'm not kicked out of the business, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just going to say that I enjoyed your work on the Transformers movies, but I'm very happy that you're doing other things because I want to see these other things. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to know what your favorite uh, scene to shoot in this movie was. Uh, um, you know, it was a difficult scene, but I liked it. It was... Uh, when Jake and Yaya uh, go to Poppy's and they deliver the money. Um, you know, every there's, every, there's a scene in every movie where it's very difficult. An actor, won't throw a, a tizzy, but like there were a lot of words. There was too many words written in the scene. And, and, and um, you know, we're shooting this as such a fast clip. And we don't have, it's not like Mission Impossible where Tom Cruise can go back three times and reshoot the scene over and over and over. I mean, literally, if we didn't shoot it, it's not in the movie. And Jake's like, it has to be emotional. It has to be emotional. It has to be emotional. And this was Jake's hot day. Every actor has a right. There's a day where it's like, this is really passionate for an actor. And because um, actors are out there. And you got to, as a director, you got to understand that. And... And he, it has to be emotional. And I'm like, Jake, I mean, I want to cry right now. We, I want it to be emotional, but we have three motherfucking hours to shoot this, okay? <laughs> so, um, all kidding aside, we shot, but it wasn't working. And um, uh, we shot some stuff, and then we, came, we were lucky to come back, because the problem was this town was so busy, we couldn't get that location. Again. We were able to find it for, get it for another four hours, and we came in and we shot it. And that was a tough scene. But I, I really liked the scene, because Yaya improv Jake improv um, I don't know, I really liked that scene. Do you have any plans in the imminent future to reunite with Jerry Bruckheimer? And also, is there a movie that you may have seen, over a, a classic movie, an only recent movie, where you would have been like, you're watching it, and as you're watching it, you're just left with the impression that like, damn, they should have gotten me. Or like, I really, or I could have made that better. Okay, there's I a couple movies. There are a couple level. movies where uh, I was I was given Saving Private Ryan before Stephen. Okay, Stephen, when I saw it, that's the greatest movie, the greatest first scene of any movie I've ever seen. Okay, um, I would have never done a better job. Stephen was perfect for that. Um, I was given um, uh, Black Hawk Down. And I'm like, this is way too violent. There's no way anyone's going to go to this movie. I am so glad Ridley, Ridley Scott did that movie. Okay, um, so I'm glad they didn't pick me. Thank God. Okay, and I didn't say yes. Um, uh, I think my first movie I was ever given when I went to meet Stephen when I was a kid uh, at, 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 at the desk of Raiders Lost Ark story. He gave me Small Soldiers, and I didn't. I said no to that. Um, it's kind of weird. Your first movie you're offered and. Uh, uh, I said no. You, the first movie I was going for with a vengeance was Speed. Okay? I lost that movie. Okay? Uh, Jan Devant did a great job. I want to follow up with what this gentleman said. Are, has there any talk about you and Jerry Bruckheimer doing anything? Okay. Jerry, Jerry and I are great friends. Um, Jerry is an amazing producer. Let me give you an idea about what a great producer he is. So Jerry's got the longest desk in Hollywood. Okay? It was Don Simpson set over here. It's literally almost... It's almost like from that end of this chair to about next to her. That's how long it is, okay? It's, it's really true. And um, uh, when, I'm doing, when I was doing Armageddon, Jerry would come in like a real producer like 11.30 in the morning, and I'm there at 9 o'clock in the edit room. And um, he's like, Jerry was like the Chinese water torture guy. It was like literally drip, drip. He would make you feel bad. But like in a, in a nice way, it's like, you come into the editor room, okay, guys, we're fuck up today. I'm like, it makes you feel great, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, 
So I'm literally like, in his office waiting for him. And I said, is Jerry around? He goes, well, he's working out with the trainer. I'm like, okay, let me call him. Because I just I said, Jerry, hey, I just read uh, Godzilla was competing with us with Armageddon. And I said, Jerry, Godzilla, they have a whole album. We don't have shit. <laughs> and there was a long pause like this. Let me call you back. <laughs> Three days later, we had Aerosmith sitting in his edit room. <laughs> That's a great producer. Uh, uh, but, 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 we, but Jerry and I talk about uh, working together, um, and uh, I really can't wait to uh, work with him again. My last question of the night. I'm excited to see Top Gun, by the way. I've heard really good things about Top Gun. Uh, that, remember we talked about Top Gun. Just for a minute. Um, they know what, I was, I was hinting at that at something earlier. You know what I'm talking about. Um, what? Uh, maybe a screening. Um, oh. a, a, anyway, okay, so uh, my, uh, my last question for you, uh, what are you... I bet a, you the director won't be as fun as me. No, the, Joseph yeah. is not going to be... <laughs> the, no, no chance. Um, what are you... Is, I, I heard rumors about Rob, Robopocalypse, but what exactly are you thinking about for the future? I mean, ro I really do like Robopocalypse. There's a problem with this, that movie. Uh, uh, Stephen prepped it, and um, he asked me... After he saw 13 hours, he'd like me to do it. But the problem is there's 30 million, because he was literally built stages, whatever. So there's $30 million against a movie, which would go on top of the movie. Um, so it would be very expensive, because you know, you've got to you know, yeah, recoup it. Yeah. So. so do you know what you're going to do next? I mean, I've got this movie, that uh, an idea I created uh, 14 years ago called Black Five that I'm working on, um, which is a cool mission movie. It's a cool concept, high concept. Um, there's a couple of great World War II things, um, and then I don't know. We'll see. That's something. And then I'm re re reconstituting Platinum Dunes with Brad Fuller. Oh. Okay, there we go. Yeah. I am so curious about you in World War II, doing a movie. I'm, I am literally floored by this right now because I didn't know you were even thinking about it. Yeah. So. Is is it like a story? Is it a there, remake? One's or? a very very emotional story uh, that's pertinent for today, and it's not like an old man World War II. It's dealing with young people during World War II. Um, so uh, I can't talk about it right now, but you know. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Bay. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. A lot of fun. It was a lot of fun hanging with you. Don't